Everybody, shh. Steve doesn't know we're live. A M Vivian, M Vivian Junior. Who? M Vivian. Steve, we're live. <laughs> Already? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> Not really sure. That's cool. But we are talking about Vivian. A M Vivian Junior. Amphibians today? Should I? I guess I need to start, huh? Yeah, we should probably intro. <sighs> All right. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to Zoo Adventures today. Um, so excited to have you. We are in a, a really unique location today. Uh, for those of our visitors from other places, it's cold and rainy today in, in Asheboro. It's chilly out there. I love the cold. It's hopping. I love the cold. And it's chilly here. Our friends in England, I know Jane might be watching with her daughter Florence. Um, she was saying the other day, it's cold over in England. Nova Scotia, thank you guys. Brazil, I can't, I can't imagine it's chilly down there. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. Where are you watching from today? It's so much, we really do enjoy watching and seeing where you guys are from. Um, it kind of makes our days, we kind of go, oh, Texas? Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama? This is so cool to see where you guys are from. California last week. I need to put these down. You're enjoying those puppets I'm enjoying a lot. Puppets, puppets. I'm going to put them down. So today, we're in the zoo's classroom, sort of. It's more like a, a break room more than anything else. And if you've been watching some of the other programs, this is where Leslie and Nikki oftentimes program for, from. We're not outside because of the temperatures. All of our animal ambassadors, and we have some ambassadors to share with you today, all of our ambassadors have temperature regulations that they can and can't go out to, either too cold or too warm. So today, it's a little too chilly for all the different animals that we're going to share with you. We're going to share three with you um, over time. Um, so it's a little too chilly outside. So Wendy and I are inside today in our zoo classroom, break room, storage room, and now today a studio. <laughs> so it's multi-purpose room. But we are talking amphibians today. Amphibians. Comes from a Greek word, amphibios. I assume I'm pronouncing that right. It sounds like a really strong name. Amphibios. It's a being living two lives. And amphibians do live two distinct lives in two different ways. There's a young phase, egg phase. Juvenile larva, so there's a larval phase that grows up into an adult through metamorphosis, through changing of form. Of form. We got... You can show them. Show them... The metamorphosis. The metamorphosis? Oh, yeah, remember? Oh, you want to do it now? I, I thought it should... Because it's, I mean, it's just, there's not much to it, really. It's just this little... This is what you're talking about? I mean, there's the little tiny eggs that go into um, tadpoles, that go into froglets, that go into... Is that what you're talking about? Well, there's another way you could show them. Oh, that's right! You could, you could practice your pitching again. Oh, don't say that. But, we, we know what happened last time we practiced <laughs> pitching. That was not a good thing. I had to ice my arm for a week. Check this out. Ready? So, two life phases. Check it out. Ready? Boom! Eggs! What do eggs turn into if you're a frog or a toad? Boom! An upside down tadpole. How's that? That better? And then you begin to grow, you begin to get your legs, you become more of a tadpole with legs. And then you become almost an entire frog. Take it out. Boom. Can you get down there, Wendy? Yes. The rain's hurting my arthritis, but not that bad. And then you get this one. I almost fell for it. <laughs> <laughs> what comes next? You've gone all through the cycle. All we have left is the adult. Ready? Boom. The adult. Look at the coolest shout out today. Flat children. Let's see who's who. Whoa. Go ahead and pull them off. Go ahead and pull them off all the way off? Yeah. I'm afraid of the babysitters. Yeah, we had a, a polar bear babysitting him. So Eli, flat Eli, 
flat Luke. Best babysitter ever, however. Look at their shirts. How cute is that? They're like, they're, they're flat zookeepers. They're flat zookeepers. Eli and Luke. So they got to come to the zoo. That is our, that is our shout out today. Eli and Luke should not be slapping each other. And there's a polar bear as a babysitter. Can smell everything. You're not getting away. And a hawk who can see everything. So thank you guys so very much. It's kind of fun to see that. So amphibians, two lives. We went through the life cycle. So that's two stages of life. Egg, juvenile, larva, young, metamorphosis or change in form, and then the adult. It also has to do with where they live. They spend a lot of their young lives in the water. And as adults, they can emerge from the water. Still usually associated with the water close by. So amphibian, amphibios, a Greek word meaning of two lives. And it's kind of neat. It's a, it's a whole program in and of itself where these words come from sometimes. Why do we use the word amphibian? Well, that's why we use the word amphibian. It's kind of cool to think about that. So amphibians are really neat. You guys ready to meet our first amphibian? We have a small salamander. Salamanders, newts, frogs, toads, those are cilians, those are amphibians. And the one in our first one? I'm over here. I'm putting gloves on to protect the salamander from me. Not to protect me from the salamander. Thank you to curator Dustin Smith for finding us this salamander. His name is Forrest. What a great name, Hannah Decker. Hannah Decker came up with the name Forrest. Because that's where they're found. How cool is that? And Hannah said, she continued her naming thing, said, well, like Forrest Stump, because they live in stumps. Not bad. Good job, Hannah. Now, gloves on. Check this out. Looks like we might be having technical issues. We have technical issues. Can you guys still hear me? Yo, how we doing? I'm going to squirt my hands. I'm going to open the door. With water. Yes, I know water's getting on the ground. This is that special RO, reverse osmosis water. Has a lot of the chemical stuff taken out of it. So now my gloves are nice and wet. And I'm going to introduce you to the first animal we have. How can we be having, wait a minute. How can we be having technical issues in the most controlled environment we've ever been in? I don't know. We had four bars when we started, and we only have one now. Hope you guys are hanging in with us. I'll come to you if that helps. A little salamander. Hopefully that's better. Sorry, guys, at home. We tested it earlier. It was just fine. Check this out. Meet Forrest, everybody. Say hi to Forrest. What kind of salamander is Forrest? Um, what's he have on his back? He's a spotted salamander. How neat is that? They lay about 250 eggs a year. And get this, salamanders are active winter time oftentimes that's breeding season for them how is that even possible these guys have no fur they have no hair have no scales have nothing like that to keep them safe from the elements but they're out there moseying around looking for mates then the females again lay about 250 eggs the baby salamanders go through that metamorphosis, they go through a change. They might have external gills, all kinds of salamanders, different things. We're going to show you some different colored salamanders in a little bit. One neat thing about these guys, and it's still being studied, not 100% sure, is their eggs turn kind of green over time. Remember, they're kind of gelatinous. They don't have that hard external covering. That's one definition of an amphibian. It doesn't have a hard egg shell. Where are you going, Forrest? He's like, hey, this is new. Shy. He's camera shy. So
so that when they lay their eggs, they begin to turn kind of a green color. And scientists think that's an algae of some form. You wanna show them how big you are? Not really, not very big. And they don't really know why. Maybe, huge maybe, there's some sort of oxygen exchange maybe from the algae to the egg. Not sure. It's kind of a neat thing to think about. All these relationships that we're not 100% sure of, even today in this day and age of science and studying animals in a natural world. These guys can get to be about, oh, seven, eight, nine inches long. So Forrest still has some growing to do. How's that? Yeah, Wendy. We had some questions about where we would find this spotted salamander. Spotted salamanders are found here, we're again, in Asheboro, which is kind of the central Piedmont region, and west. Got to look for them hard, though. They're going to hide really well. Find them under stuff. Not like our next salamander. Our next salamander is a really good hider. This guy you can oftentimes find under logs and branches, um, rock stumps, things like that. So that's forest, our spotted salamander. Great job, forest. Scooching a little bit wet. I'm working on our 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 signal. <laughs> Wendy's left. Wendy's out in the hallway While all of a sudden. Steve's talking, I'm working on our signal with our MiFi a little bit. I'm gonna take these gloves off. I'm not as worried about COVID or anything, but I just don't want to transfer anything to the next salamander. Amphibians have permeable skin. Permeable skin. That means that their skin is very thin. You might have kind of saw it. You might have kind of seen it. You might have saw it, can have seen it, <laughs> on um, forests. And that's a huge defining character characteristic of amphibians, having that permeable skin. And we're going to talk about that at the end of the program. That permeable skin. They can actually take water up through their skin. They don't have to drink it. They can take it up through their skin. They also take up oxygen through their skin. They breathe. They respire. They take up oxygen through their skin. So that skin is really important. Now, some of them still have lungs. So some of them still can't breathe air, just like you and I do. But a lot of them will take up their oxygen through their skin, and they can take up water through their skin. That also means they can lose water through their skin. So no water in their environment, they can dehydrate very quickly, and that's a huge problem. Our second salamander, that I want to introduce you to is Commander. Commander Salamander. How about that for a name? Sometimes maybe we're not the most creative in naming. More gloves. Again, this is just a safety precaution. And this is protecting the salamander from me. In case I've got lotion or salts or other things on my hands. Pop tart. Now you're telling secrets. I do like a brown sugar cinnamon pop tart. I know. <laughs> Wendy and I have been together way too long since the middle of March. Got all kinds of things going on here. Remember the water? R-O, reverse osmosis water. One of you guys, now it's multi-sensory for you guys. How's that? <laughs> no? <laughs> Try to be a little bit fun. This is Commander Salamander. Steve's getting Commander out of his uh, travel tote. You guys might have seen the, the snake travel tote the other day when we talked about oh, snakes. Yeah. So this isn't where they actually live. This is just how they travel. So this is Commander Salamander. He is an Eastern Tiger Salamander. He's a Tiger Salamander. And Tiger Salamanders come in a huge variety of colors. From the name, you might imagine that some of them have stripes and are kind of more yellowish, and that is 100% correct. This guy, a little more olivey color, and you see more of spots on him. He's still a tiger salamander, though. 
He's one of the largest terrestrial or land-based salamanders we have. This guy can reach almost a foot in length, maybe even 13 inches. And you can see he's a pretty big boy, a little more active than he usually is, too. Where are you going today, Commander? I love it. You're showing off people how agile you can be. There's that skin, that permeable skin. Here's a predator now. This is a hunter. He's taking the likes of worms and grubs and bugs. But when he gets to be that bigger size, he can eat crayfish. He might eat other salamanders. Shoot, at a foot long, he might even eat small mice. So he is an amazing predator in his habitat, in his world. You find these guys in eastern North Carolina. You find them kind of Wake County and South. Hoke and Scotland County. But man, oh day, are they hard to find, guys. When they're not in breeding season, which is winter again, these guys will burrow down, and they dig their own burrows. They don't, kind of, they don't kind of get in somebody else's. They're digging their own burrow. And their burrows might be, get this, a foot and a half deep. This little salamander is a busy, busy guy when he's out in his own natural spaces. Sense of smell might be pretty good. They believe that they use chemical cues to find their mates. Commander, the Eastern Tiger Salamander. Where are you going, bud? Here at the zoo, he gets crickets primarily. Whoop, what do you see? He's like, oh, camera. I should show off my better side. When they breed so early, and we mentioned that they do breed early, right? That's important. They lay their eggs in what's called ephemeral pools. Ephemeral. They don't last too long. But in the wintertime, going into spring, they might stick around a little bit longer. Those ponds, those ephemeral pools. And they're just little, just little pockets of water. But the key thing there is that in those ephemeral pools, there's no predators. Why is that important? Why is it important to not have any predators in your pool where you're laying your eggs? I think that's kind of one of those no-brainer questions, isn't it? Yeah, if there's no predators, primarily fish in this instance, there's no predators to eat the eggs and eat the larvae. But remember, these guys are breeding in the winter. I always find that amazing. That, to me, is one of the most amazing salamander stats. They do shed their skin, oftentimes all in one piece. Let me see what time it is. 10, 19? Okay, so it's safe to say this because you guys are either done with breakfast or you're waiting for lunch. They shed their skin in one piece. They oftentimes eat it. Mmm, yummy. Yay. Pop-Tarts? Collagen. Yay. So... But why? Why eat your skin? I'm gonna put. I'm gonna go ahead and put um, Commander back. You guys get a good, good shot at Commander. Say bye. Bye, Commander. Why do that? Why eat the skin? Why eat your skin? You're recycling nutrients. There's good stuff for you if you're if you're a salamander and you're gonna eat that. I would be remiss in not telling you this. Those of you that don't live in North Carolina, North Carolina is the salamander capital of the world in diversity. Don't be jealous. <laughs> Over 60 different species of salamanders found in North Carolina. Over 60 different species found right here in the Targo State. I think that's an amazing, I love that statistic. I think it's kind of cool. Come check this out. And they come in a lot of different colors. We met one of these. This is the spotted. 
You saw the tiger salamander, so they have those, those stripes and the black colors, hug colors. Over here is a marbled salamander. Now these are just models. These are models. There's nothing real about these guys, except for the color and the size and the shape. And then this is the red salamander. How cool is that? How neat. So a variety of colors in salamander world. And then there's the biggest salamander. Oh, check that out. Another model. No, yes. that is not a salamander, That's a salamander. Steve. You saw, you saw forest. You saw commander. This is a salamander. His nickname is the Snot Otter. He's a hellbender. And they live in the water. So this is, we mentioned that the eastern, the eastern tiger salamander is one of the largest terrestrial salamanders in the world. Getting up to 12, 13 inches long. This is one of the largest salamanders in the world at all. And the lar one of the largest salamanders in North America for sure. The hellbender. Can you believe though? Check that. Just look at the table. There's salamanders as long as the table. How long is that table for the for the That's kids about at home? Five feet long. Well, here you go. I'm six. There's salamanders that are six feet long. Where would we find those, Steve? China. Chinese Ooh. giant salamanders. Oh, that's right. That's right. Right. That big. A salamander. Crazy. Whew. All right. We mentioned salamanders. We've talked about those guys for a little bit. We have another group of animals to share with you, and that's frogs and toads. I have a live toad. Don't want to meet the live toad. Show of hands. It was awesome. I did that last time with the elephants. And hands went up, actually. It's kind of fun to see hands or clapping, whatever it was. Thank you guys so much for being inter interactive. Um, as I get my gloves on, I do want to call out, and I wrote their names down, so I didn't get them wrong this time. I got a couple names. I missed a couple names last time. I want to call out Emily. She's one of our zoo researchers in conservation, education, and science. Thank you for answering questions today, Emily. Leslie, some of you have met Leslie and seen Leslie before. She's one of our educators at the zoo. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, Kathy is also here. Kathy's involved, heavily involved in our play program with the North Carolina Zoo. Um, does our preschool programs and our birthdays. She's answering questions. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, uh, Kathy. And then Beth, our fearless leader, our curator of education is also out there answering questions. Um, all four of them also doing about 6,423 other things right now too during this time of coronavirus. So we thank you guys so much for spending some time with us and answering questions today. I think I saw Bob's name pop oh, Bob up on here too. too. Well, thank you, Bob. Bob is our neighborhood naturalist. Um, if you've gone over to Adventures in Education, the Facebook group, You've seen Kathy, you've seen Bob, you've seen Linda, you've seen Leslie, you've seen Nikki, you've seen Corinne. Get the hands wet one more time. Introducing you to a toad. Frogs and toads, similar, but not identical. Toads are more hoppers, frogs are more jumpers. Sugar. You want me to get everybody white this time for you? Yeah, just in case. Ooh. So I'm going to sit for a second. This is sugar. And sugar is a cane or a marine toad. Make sure I get a good grip on sugar. A lot of amazing stories on these guys. They're found originally in Central and South America. See a beautiful color? Amazing camouflage, as you might imagine. Found originally in Central and South America. They've been accidentally, in some cases, and on some cases uh, on purpose, taken to other locations. You may have heard of the problem with cane toads in Australia. In the early 1900s, about 3,000 of these guys were imported to Australia. And they did that because they had a cane beetle problem. They had a cane beetle problem. They thought, you know what? Let's bring an animal over here that eats bugs. It'll eat all the beetles and it'll go away. Natural pest control. 
Well, as that as often happens when you do something like that, it didn't really work. They might have eaten some of the cane, some of the beetles, but they found a lot of other food there they liked. And they found that it was also a great um, breeding site, let's say. How many originally? 3,000 originally were brought over to take care of this beetle problem. Trying to do it right, trying to do it naturally. Didn't do a whole lot of studying though, apparently. Because the cane toads took over. They're a huge invasive species problem in Australia and many locations in the world today. They're just incredible survivors. They're amazingly adaptable. That's their job. And if there's no predators, if there's no animals there that can, that can deal with you, these guys are highly toxic. Can you see that gland right above my finger? That's a toxic gland right above my finger. Now, it's not, I'm not worried about the poisoning on me right now because I have these gloves on. But that's one of the ways he protects himself is with that gland, with those bufo toxins, those toad toxins in there. So if there's no predators in the area and animals that aren't adapted to dealing with the toxin, these guys can multiply and breed willy-nilly, and they did. They also ate everything. So by eating everything, and then by eating the food from where the other animals wanted to eat, came a huge issue. From 3,000 animals, today there's an estimate of 200 million of them in Australia alone. From 3,000. And they're devastating the ecosystems of Australia. They can lay 8,000 8, and maybe 35,000 eggs. One female at one time. And they might do that twice a year. And even though the survival rate's only estimated at 0.5%, that means each female can produce, with each clutch, 40 to 175 babies per clutch that survive to adulthood the cane toad or the marine toad big guy about the size of a coffee mug big fella big problem also today in florida they're being seen in florida they're trying to get ahead of it and that's a problem with invasive species, guys. You just put these animals out there. If they find their way there or they're brought there on purpose, man, if there's no predators, if there's no natural controls, the population could take off. We've seen that in Florida with some of the large, uh, large constrictor snakes as well, the pythons. This is another example of an invasive species going a little bit crazy. The cane toad. And again, this is sugar. Ready to go back, sugar? People were asking why we named her Sugar. That's a great question. You know, I don't know. Do you know, Wendy? Well, cane toad, sugar cane, <laughs> sugar. Uh, little little play us. on where we find, where we have found them. In... I love us. We are so silly. Whew. Amphibians, beings of two lives. How cool is that? But there's a big problem going on. There's a huge problem, and you can help with this problem. <clears throat> Put these down. There's over 8,100 species of amphibians in the world. 8,100 species of, amphibian, of amphibians. A huge chunk, 7,000 of those are frogs and toads. 750-ish salamanders. But there's a problem. We're losing them very quickly. They believe a third to a half are endangered or becoming extinct. In, da in, da in danger, I am in danger of becoming extinct. Not classified as endangered, but in danger of becoming extinct. Because of several reasons. I know you guys could shout out some if you were if we, if we were actually live, you'd be saying, I know, I know. Habitat loss. Yeah, absolutely. Big one. 
warming planet. Remember that permeable skin. It's too hot, they can lose water through their skin. A fungus called chytrid gives them something called <clears throat> chytridiomycosis. Chytridiomycosis from the chytrid fungus. That's a mouthful. It is a mouthful, and I just learned how to say it. That hardens the skin. It's a fungus found in a lot of places. But as the environments are changing, as their habitats are changing, as the, world, as the earth is warming, you're seeing it pop up in different locations. Animals that don't have that immune, that don't have ways to cope with that chytrid, are, their skin is hardening, and they can't take up water and oxygen anymore. So there's a lot of challenges out there. But something you guys can do, a very simple thing you can do, is the craft for today. Check this out. It's a toad abode. You gotta love a toad abode. What is that, Steve? I have no idea. Do you? I don't know. Pick it up. Let's, Let's see. Let's pick it up and see what it is. Oh. oh. I see what it's it is. It's a terracotta pot. This little knot just cut out, literally knocked out. Paint it as you wish. This has to be. It's pretty cute, Nikki. You is killed this, it. This has to be a Nikki creation. Yeah, Nikki created that. A bode, sweet of God, love a bode, sweet abode. So you put this outside, kind of maybe under a bush or in some shaded areas, and animals, amphibians, will use this as home. Kind of cool. You can use the bottom of the planter and fill it with water and then put the house next to it. And if you don't want to crack your uh, pot, you can keep it full and you can just lean it up on top of there. And then you have water and a toad home yep. for your frog and toad in your garden. Yep. I'm gonna get a little bit serious with you guys. It's always fun, we love sharing stuff with you. But with this crisis that's going on, we might be losing amphibians at a tremendous rate. Uh, as we said, a half are threatened with extinction. A half of them out there could be threatened with extinction. Something we can do over there. But why should we care? Why should we care about amphibians? It's just a toad, it's just a frog. What happens? Who cares if it goes away? Well, we do. And I know you do. I know you care. Think about this. There are medicines that have been created from the, the, vet, the toxins of frogs. So we get rid of these animals, that opportunity to even search goes away. Right? We don't let that happen. Imagine if frogs and toads went away, the number of pests mosquitoes. The, the tadpoles are voracious larval mosquito eaters. The tadpoles are also really important at taking care of aquatic vegetation. So they're eating that aquatic vegetation so it doesn't overgrow everything. The adults, huge pest controls, right? And then just a cultural aspect. So many cultures have the frogs and toads so high they hold them with such high esteem. We don't need that to go away either. We don't need that cultural side of these animals to go either. And then for you and me, what are the calls of a frog? Can you imagine in the spring? And you can do this at home. Check this out. Ooh. These are kind of cool. I'm going to take this one, and I'm going to take this one, and I'll take this one. And check this out. Little toy frog. Let's learn their call. Right? But you know what that one is? And I know that some of the people are going, well, that, that's, that's a toy frog. Surely it doesn't sound like that. I have an app. If you watch the gopher frogs, then on my, in my world, I have an app. I'm going to click on that frog call app. Frog call information. It's called Frog Calls. Okay. Yeah, it's not very scientific, not very crazy, um, as far as the name. But listen to this. This call. And then here. Really? Really? It's my turn. Are you done? 
Are you done? Listen to this. That's right? pretty close. Isn't that close? And it tells you what kind it is? Yeah. It's spring all more peeper. information on here. So it's a spring peeper. So you can do it through these stuffed animals, or you can have that app. I like this one. This is one of my favorites. And then that is, I'm not going to tell you, I'm just going to pull up, pull up the animal here. I'm going to click because I know what it is because I, I can read the tag. Whoa, that was pretty close. It's pretty close, isn't it? What kind is it? Let's see. Up, oh, American Toad. So it's sort of like something for all ages. Exactly. You can do it this way with the, with the animals that are stuffed and then have the clicks. You can do it with an app. You can learn these kind of things. There's a wonderful citizen science program out there called Frog Watch. Some of you may have seen that before. Maybe even some of you are part of Frog Watch. You go out, you learn the calls, you go sit to us, you go to a location, you sit and you listen. You listen for a call and you mark it down. Frog watch. Now you become a citizen scientist. You share the information with scientists. Now they begin to populate a map. Who's what where? I love it. And for a, for a group of animals, these amphibians, these animals with two lives, larval stage juvenile, and then the adult stage, where they live in the water and on land. They could use your help. Awareness is first. So we can't thank you enough for tuning in today to learning about the amphibians in the area. You met three. You met Forest, the spotted salamander. You met Commander, the tiger salamander. And Sugar, you met the cane or the marine toad. Learn about some of the challenges that they had in front of them and one of the challenges they pose in an invasive species and we saw a little bit of the bio effects. We we're so much to talk about. We wanted to be regu regular. We wanted to be ready to be able to talk about what we could. But I think we've kind of gone over a lot of the really cool, excuse me, a lot of the really cool stuff. And you learned about the frog call app. How fun! And I got to sit down for a little bit. <laughs> we're not getting rained on. It's we're nice. We're not getting rained on. It's not that cold right now where we are. We should. Uh, we should give them a little hint for Friday why they should stay tuned for Friday. I don't know, I don't know it, but it's some sort of move it, move it dance. Maybe you like, like to move it, move it. You like, like to move it, move it. I like to move it, move it. You <laughs> like to move it, move it. They can figure it out. Check it out. Friday, 10 o'clock, Zoo Adventures. Steve and Wendy will be back with you and we're gonna be moving it on over there. Thanks for watching today and we'll see you again. Friday, 10 o'clock. Stay safe. We'll see you soon.